All right, so we talk about the risks inherent in apps. This is your, of course, primary attack surface, at least for Android, is to just make a malicious app and trick people into installing it, and for jailbroken iPhones that allow this. Uh, uh, all right, so here's the big security issues. Uh, the worst one is fragmentation on Android, which means people are using many versions of the operating system, including really old ones. This is a big security problem. It's also, by the way, a big developer problem. And there are something like 2,000 form factors for Android. So you can't decide how to make your app look good. It's on all sorts of different displays. Um, then there's sensitive information leakage. is very common, where private data like passwords and other things are leaking out of the app where it shouldn't be going. Uh, people store things on the device that are sensitive, like passwords and credit card numbers. and if they don't do it right, it can be stolen from there. And then, of course, uh, weak authentication, uh, things like people are authenticating with a four-digit PIN that can just be brute forced or things that are sent over the internet without encryption. Yeah? Uh, what kind of app risks are available for non-jailbroken iPhones? What permissions do the apps have? Because uh, I know it's a separate account now. It's like web or mobile or something like that. I don't know. It's a good question. I, you never see it. It doesn't present you with a list of what it's going to do and have you approve it the way Android does. Uh, it's a good question. I don't know the answer, but I'm hoping to by the end of the semester. Now that we can really dig into iPhone apps, we can hopefully find the problem. Anyway, oh, that's good. You can figure out how to make that thing quiet. It would be... Ah. That's hacking. Anyway, we'll see if that works. That may make... Again, maybe not. <laughs> it's not changing. Oh wait, there's another one. There's an alpha. This is pretty exciting. Yep. Well, anyway. <laughs> well, I'll pause a minute. Let's see if this works. It's pretty. Uh, of course, that might be what they did, which they called fixing, was turn it on all the time. Anyway. Well, I'm trying to hit the off button now. Yeah, it does not seem to have the effect of being off. Anyway, we'll cope. I'll turn it into them, and they'll change it in another random way by next time. Um, anyway, um, the other thing, of course, is things that don't even live up to their specs, which is, again, particularly a problem with Android. Um, if you make Android is open source, you can modify it as you wish. And you can go way below Google's specs. And if you do, the only thing Google will do is not let you use Google Play or Google Maps. And if you're willing to accept that, you can modify it however you like. And a lot of people do. And of course, they bring your own device. An enormous number of people are using uh, home devices at work that are not under the control of the IT department and such. So uh, here's the, this is the fundamental issue. Um, do you want a closed platform where the company Apple controls everything you can do. You can't run any app that Apple doesn't like. You have to pay whatever they want to charge for whatever apps they offer you and only do what they think you should be doing. And then you're very safe. It's like being a child in a playpen in the backyard with your parents. You can do this, you can't do that. Only good people can go in here. Or you want freedom, like Linux, where you can do anything you want and therefore there's malware and bad apps and all that jazz. And then there's Microsoft, which vanished completely, but supposedly is going to come back with yet another Microsoft phone and another Microsoft App Store. Uh, we'll see what happens. It was pretty much a disaster last time. So that's the point. Apple is closed and much more secure. All the code has to be signed by Apple, unless you sideload it, which is possible but not common. Uh, it has a address space layout randomization these days and a, and a better sandbox, and there is no shell. You cannot get to a command prompt to type in command line commands. There's no SSH unless you jailbreak it, so it's uh, a lot of the attacks just aren't possible. Android is open and, of course, much less secure. You can write your app yourself and put it on there. You can download it from any unauthorized source, and even if you get it from the official store, they don't clean it very well, so there's a bunch of poison in the store. Now here's the fragmentation. Um, this is the iOS versions as of just a few days ago. 76% are using the latest version of iOS. Android has never made it up to even 1% of the devices using the latest version of Android, ever. Maybe at the very right beginning, not in years. So the 4.x is still 35%, still the most popular of all versions. The 4.x that, that I use in the class, it's um, 
pretty awful. So they fixed a lot of security problems, but those fixes have not reached the users, so what's the point of that? Um, so like I said, the app store, uh, apps in the store reviewed by Apple's process, screen with a static analyzer, and then um, they run in a sandbox and they have their own segment of memory that they cannot read memory from other apps. And the end result is it's really quite effective. There have been a very small number of malicious apps in the Apple App Store, but they vanish quickly and the developers are punished ruthlessly. Uh, Google is, has runs them through this thing called Bouncer that is pathetic and just lets poison through all the time. So there have been 42,000 apps that were poisoned in there in 2013 and on it goes. Um, and you can sideload. You can load an Android app from anywhere. You can just sign it yourself. Uh, that it never even, Google never even gets a chance to apply their weak security measures to it. Um, now in Xcode 7, uh, which I think a couple of years ago it came out, Apple now allows you to write apps and put them on your phone without getting them approved by Apple if you want to. That's side loading. This is a new, until before then you had to pay $99 a year to become a member of their developers program and get Apple to sign it. Now it is possible to side load apps but you can't get them in the App Store without Apple seeing them, so nobody else is going to see them except you and maybe the people in your company that you send it to. But um, that's a convenience for developers, but it's not a major security risk because I don't think it's at all likely that an innocent normal user could be tricked into installing one of those apps um, when they're used to going to the App Store. Uh, and you can, so here's some instructions how to do it. You can sideload it directly from a computer through the USB cable and put it on so you can test it, which is good for developers but uh, you know, not a, a very large risk for, random, for normal users. So if you run Android, you have to run antivirus. In round terms from a couple of years ago, there are 100 million Windows viruses, 1 million Android viruses, 100 OS X viruses, and zero iPhone viruses. So the risk, Android is almost as dangerous as Windows and you need antivirus on it. And there are a lot of antivirus products of, uh, available for it. I haven't seen tests of them. Uh, antivirus is extremely ineffective in general. Uh, it has stops 2 to 3 percent of threats these days, but it does stop a certain category of attacker, which is the lowest skilled attacker that actually sends one binary to a million people in email. It'll stop that. A lot of people are smarter than that now, but it does stop some of the bad stuff. Uh, so you can, uh, manufacturers often add extra things. Samsung added a touch whiz overlay to Android, which created a serious vulnerability. So you could uh, have a web page that would create a factory reset. Um, there are a lot of uh, the devices make other errors. Um, this one would send your authenticated pin into the log. A lot of people put secrets in the log. Um, this one would cache them in web view so they can be stolen again. Uh, storing data in local SQLite databases. Uh, iOS, in order to make a uh, entertaining graphic. When you close a page, it would shrink down, so they would take a snapshot of that page and modify the image, and those images would have a picture of whatever data you typed in that page that could be stolen. And uh, so anyway, various caches and logs often have had data leak into them, and these get fixed in later versions, which is good if you actually use the later version. Um, DMessage is another log. Samsung devices stored user data here in a buffer, and it could be read by any other app. It's like putting them in the syslog. Carrier IQ is the one I mentioned. This was something included by default in all the iPhones, and nobody didn't tell the end user, and somebody finally detected that it was sending information about every website you used and all your phone calls to some unknown third party, and they said, maybe that's the government spying on me. And they claimed it was just them spying for statistical aggregates on their users so they could tell if the traffic was flowing well or not. But uh, Apple did remove it after the scandal hit, saying, you know, you don't need the bad press from this being all over the place. Um, so in general, uh, all the typ typical thing wrong with web apps tends to be wrong with mobile apps, that you have, uh, you input data into one system, which then passes it on to another system that misunderstands it. Um, so you, know, you can do JavaScript injection from, from URLs and so on. Uh, one simple attack that worked when one time was you, you saw a, a normal URL will start with HTTP. A, for, for, for a long time, if you just had a URL that started with phone, it would dial the phone. So you could make a web page that would just dial the phone and make calls, which the user will then be billed for. And uh, it was necessary to modify, I think it was Android, they had to modify it so now it will always pop up a box and ask for permission before dialing the phone. Um, 
So there's secure on device storage. This is something people want. They want to store your password, your cookie, your credit card number, your other personal things on the device somewhere. And yet it seems like an oxymoron to have secure on device storage when you're very likely to have the whole device stolen. So there are various ways to do it. Um, I mean, Apple has the best answer. They really have a secure element, which is a special cryptographic coprocessor to put data on, but only the Apple apps can use it. Um, other ones have a weaker attempt, sort of like a password manager or the key vault on Mac OS X, where the operating system has an encryption routine that hopefully encrypts it in a way that's hard to break, which is not as perfect as a special chip for the purpose, but it's probably pretty good. Unfortunately, most apps I look at just invent their own. If they do encryption, they just make up something uh, that looks like it took them about five minutes and it's not a good plan. So they say, well, try to avoid storing sensitive data, that would be better. If you're gonna store it, use the recommended OS storage system. That's what it's there for and it's better than anything you're gonna invent. And specially designed hardware would be the best if your phone actually has it. I know Apple's now, iPhones all now have an SE. There's been talk about Androids with a secure element. I don't know if that has happened yet or not. Maybe in the newest ones, and maybe it may not have come out yet. Uh, so there's a lot of weak authentication. Um, your phone has some identifying numbers on it, like an IMEI number and otherwise. And uh, one big scandal, when Weave hacked into the AT&T store and exposed millions of IMEI numbers, at that time, most common apps like Twitter would just take that number and regard it as a login because that told them what phone you were on and that's all they looked at. So if someone could just duplicate that number, they could just get in your account. Um, just the kind of thing that tends to happen. Um, there are authentication standards that can be good, especially OAuth. OAuth is very good. OAuth means if I want to have you log into my thing, I can say log in with Twitter or Facebook and I will never see your Facebook password. I communicate with Facebook, I get a random number that looks like a cookie, which means I have certain permissions now, and then I never really hand take the responsibility of directly handling your password. It's carefully designed and very secure, and almost nobody uses it. It's just too much bother, and instead they do something awful, like stick your password in plain text on the device. SAML is Security Association Markup Language. We'll talk about that. In early versions, it had some serious flaws, but it's gotten better. Um, so here's the Apple's worst security breach, 114,000 iPad owners exposed with all their email addresses and their IMEA numbers and we've conspired with someone to do this and do as much harm to AT&T as possible and dumped it publicly so it all got out there. And that meant for a period of time, all these people could have, get, other people get into many iPhone apps with just that number, which is being accepted as authentication. There's the guy that did it, he's a very strange guy. I saw him at TourCon giving a talk where he was completely high on acid and it made no sense at all. He was proud of that. He stands up, I think he was standing up naked on a rooftop shouting Nazi slogans. I think when he went to court, he kept interrupting the court to shout Nazi slogans and stuff. He's a very strange guy, but he did get off in court. He did not get punished for this because the prosecutor was overzealous and attempted to illegally move the venue to New Jersey to get a more hostile jury, and that is specifically forbidden, and his defender was able to point out that that's, that's um, uh, improper behavior and that got him off. Yeah. I can still get him to get him to do a talk if you want. <laughs> yeah, I haven't put that high on my priorities list. Yeah. Maybe in the club. <laughs> you could put him in your club. But I, I know, I know. <laughs> that's, that's what people said. They said, you know, what he did was actually not that bad, but his complete failure to like be a reasonable person and cooperate with his defense counsel is what got him in such big trouble. So if you do get prosecuted for hacking, you know, get a lawyer, work with your lawyer, wear a suit, don't be an idiot, you know. <laughs> anyway, uh, all right, so a lot of people use um, clear text, username and password. This was used in a security header at one time exposing it. People use debug mode on. Another thing a lot of apps do is they use um, broken SSL, so they do not actually check the source of SSL certificates. So you can ban in the middle the HTTPS on many apps. Um, and this is all because people are just rushing to develop an app and deploy it quickly to the customers and there isn't much, if any, security audits. Uh, there was one that came out about two years ago at Christmas. Uh, some company went and analyzed all the Android tablets for sale and all the cheap ones were just fantastically um, insecure. Um, with Android USB debugging turned on, with malware already installed on it when you buy it, and so on. I got one of these uh, you know, at home, I haven't opened it, you gotta play with it. Um, anyway. 
A lot of people bring their own device to work. Um, I was amazed when this started happening about four years ago. I went to one of the really square security conventions full of managers and cops and stuff. And I thought they would say, don't let them do this. And they said, you have to let them bring their own device. We have tried telling people you can't use your own iPhone. And they will quit the company and go somewhere else. You'll lose all your good people. The fact is, people who love their mobile thing are very, very effective on their mobile thing. And they will not be happy if you take it away. It was a big deal when they took Obama's BlackBerry. It was a big deal when they took Trump's Android. Because the president really shouldn't be using these things because they're so fantastically insecure. No president has ever used email because you can't really be sure it's coming from the president. And supposedly, when the president gives commands, they really matter. Although, I don't know these days. But anyway, the, uh, so, so they, the, um, when you do become president, the uh, security agencies will force you to have a specially hardened device. They gave Obama some specially hardened imitation BlackBerry, and now they gave Trump some specially hardened version of Android. So he can, it's not as much fun as his previous phone to tweet at 3 in the morning, but it's supposedly more trustworthy. Because obviously all our enemies would like to hack into his phone and turn on the microphone and hear his talks, and we would like that not to happen. Anyway, so mobile device management is a huge issue. Here's the Gartner Square. This is ability to execute, and this is completeness of vision. So good stuff is up here. You might notice a serious lack of anybody up there. The fact is, this is a huge problem. People have all these iPhones and Androids and tablets, and they're using them for company work. And people really wish there was something like a domain controller that would really control all those devices so you know what data is on them and, and what's happening. And in fact, many products exist, but none of them are really working very well yet. Uh, there's a free one from IBM we'll use in the projects where you get to see how it works. And it's very much like a Microsoft domain controller. You have to put a special app on the phone, and then your phone is controlled by the boss. And the boss can lock your phone, wipe the data, block apps, and all that jazz, just like you would want to be able to do for the company phone. Um, all right. So. <coughs> Your app developer considers what they're trying to do. You should be using input and output validation. Data you come in, you should check to see if it's malicious. And data you pass on to another component, you should check to see if it's malicious. This is, of course, very difficult. And it's the same thing in the web app uh, security class that I taught last semester. Most people specialize in one thing, like I'm the Ruby developer, I'm the Java developer. And the problem is, when the Java product sends something to the Ruby product, Somebody needs to know both Java and Ruby to understand how what Java said might be misunderstood by Ruby. And that is contrary to the app design's designer's skill set, where they focus on one thing. And that's why many highly skilled people are doing their best, and yet they end up leaving holes you can drive a truck through. Anyway, um, error handling is important. You have to really consider errors. And uh, that's also not fun. If you look in the logs, you can see a lot of errors happening in Android apps, so you just keep going. So the big thing, prepare for phone theft. Remote wipe is something that makes managers uh, feel good, but it actually is not very good in general. Um, people tell me it's something like 10 to 15% of devices lost from enterprises with remote wipe turned on never get wiped. And this should be pretty obvious. If you have, if some of your employees have lost their phones, some of them, it was not stolen. It is really lost. It's in the bottom of their couch. It will never be found. So you're never going to be able to wipe it. It's never going to be turned on and connected to the internet again. Then some of them are stolen by smart crooks who put it in airplane mode and then wipe it and resell it or something or steal the data. And again, it never connects to the internet, so you never get a chance to wipe it. So remote wipe sounds good, but you really don't get to remote wipe all the missing devices. Uh, so server side controls are good. You should have strong authentication and um, the typical protections for any other web application. And your password reset system you must think about how vulnerable it is. There's a huge economic pressure to make it easy for people who lose their password to get in the account. But if you do that, you made it easy for the bad guys to get in. And there's just an almost unsolvable tension there. Anyway, there's the last batch of eye clickers. And then I got a couple demos to show you. Um, all right, so let's get this one going. Good. All right, so what's the most important risk when a phone is stolen? at 30.
Well, we can, I can hear alternative votes, but I think the most important thing is the information stored on the phone, on device storage. I don't like people saying information leakage. Uh, that's referring to things that leak into the wrong channel, like the log or something. But the main, the main issue here is the data stored on the phone itself. Um, yeah. Yeah, but the only information stored on the phone is what's going to leak when someone steals the phone. Not necessarily if you have weak authentication and they can access your online yeah. services. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I see. But I mean, this leakage refers to things you're in data in use getting lost, and this is data stored getting lost. And particularly stealing the phone, you're going to get the stored data. That's why it is considered a huge step forward for Apple to encrypt their stuff, so no one can get your stored data. And the fact that Android doesn't is taken as a very serious flaw. Yeah. And I would pause it E to the employer that's the most important risk. Uh, the no, the because bringing your own device is not intrinsically a risk. The risk is if there's data stored. If they make sure there's no company data on it, there's no particular risk. Fair enough. Yeah. So anyway. So if you bring your device to work, there's going to be company data on it. Not necessarily. By the way, I had some a military contractor told me that they wanted the best, the most secure platform they had. They took iPads and they turned on encryption and killed all local storage. So the only thing you can do is access data on the server and use it on the server and nothing is stored on the iPad itself, the old thin client. He said, that's what made us feel good about security. Nobody can steal data off that iPad. Anyway, um, so if I don't have too many tomatoes hitting me, we'll go on. Uh, all right, what's a risky but convenient corporate policy? And that's bring your own device. You allow people to bring their device, it makes them happy, but it obviously creates some degree of risk. One of the problems I saw with that too, you were mentioning earlier about uh, yeah. people quitting and leaving, but they also yeah. circumvent whatever security is in place in order to use their device. Over. Yeah, so yeah, and that's that's another one is when they quit. And by the way, the only person, I, the only company I've known that had any solution for this is Microsoft. Microsoft's um, OneDrive, which is their answer for Dropbox, where you store all your data. Now, if you get the latest version of their domain controller, 2012 R2, you can turn on a feature where you can store data in OneDrive, but it's all encrypted if it's company data and not if it's personal data. And the company data key is tied into your Active Directory login. So when you are terminated and no longer an employee, you cannot open those files anymore. Even if you copied them to your phone and your thumb drive and your Dropbox, they're all encrypted, but you still have access to your personal data, and they're the only company I know even thinking about that. Yeah? So this right here must be some type of, I guess you're saying this is for uh, private sector. This doesn't work for public sector at all. They don't let you bring your own home device? No, you're going to give the device that, you're going to use the device that you never give you. Well, that would be certainly the safest, but yeah, the private sector people do it all the time. And I think you'll probably find in the, uh, in the sort of military organizations, a bunch of people do it even though they're not supposed to. That's kind of what I was getting at. So but you're right. I mean, certainly, because most, in the private sector, they have, they let people do it at almost every company. Even though, it's kind of insane. Because now, I mean, you try to analyze your risk, you say, how many copies are there of that data? And you don't even know. It's in somebody's phone, it's in their Dropbox, it's on their home machine. This is kind of nuts. And that's why Microsoft has, um, a solution for that, and I don't think anybody else has at all, where all those copies will be encrypted with a key that's controlled by the company, which would be good. I don't know how well it really works, but nobody else is even thinking about that when I heard about that a couple of years ago. Anyway, um, so what was the problem with Carrier IQ? at 30, I guess. <clears throat> All right, that's leakage. Data that you thought was only going to people you trusted was in fact being sent to unknown third parties. That was the, the problem with it. It was recording what you did and sending it to someone without your consent or knowledge. 
All right, what does the SE chip permit? it makes it much less risky to store data on the device now. Your on-device storage is now safer because it's stored in a way that's very hard to steal. All right. All right. Here's another one. All right, which is the phone OS with the most fragmentation? Yeah, I forgot about the Firefox phone. They made it, I don't know if it's still out there. Still I saw one guy DEF CON with it, but I never hear it getting anywhere. You can still load it on the Yeah, device. but they were actually sold devices with it, I think, at one time, but I don't know if they're still around any. Amazon had their one called something. Yeah. Anyway, of course, that's Android. Android is the market leader because there are many, many, many different kinds of versions of Android out there, so they've flooded the market with many price points and everything else some more secure than others. All right, what's the most popular? Yeah, there you go. Did Symbian say they were gonna go back and make another version of Symbian? Because they no, got, doing Microsoft bought them. Okay, Android, okay. I know they had Symbian, then they, Microsoft bought them, and they went to Windows Phone, then they broke up, they're gonna make something else. Maybe it's gonna be Android. Yeah, a lot of people liked it, but they fouled up the company and went broke and sold out to Microsoft. All right, anyway, Android is the most popular by far. iOS is, Android is like 90% of the market. It is cheaper if you get the cheap ones and that wins, I think, in the market. Anyway, um, all right, which one suffers from mobile network operators that block updates, which is a really serious problem. <laughs> This is the worst thing you can do in security is block updates. Quit at 30. All right, and that's uh, Android. That's the problem with Android. That would be anyone but iOS. IOS was the only one that muscled the, the carriers to not stop. Uh, that could be. I, that could be. I don't know, but none of the others are significant enough to matter. Yeah. Um, all right. So which one has thousands of malicious apps in the official store? Current tanks, right? Sure, in the modern world, yeah. And that is Android, of course. That's the problem with it. They don't clean the store very well. And Apple, uh, iPhone, uh, Windows would have been lucky to have thousands of apps anyway. That was the problem. They couldn't, they just didn't have anything in the app store and that was the problem with them. Anyway, uh, all right. So which one does not let you run antivirus or firewall? All right, so um, that is iOS. You can't put it on, it's not in a store and you don't need it. All right, let me, um, now I'm gonna find out who won the iClickers. I do wanna demonstrate something, but I have to finish with the iClickers to free up my USB port. So uh, it'll take a sec. I'm going to open this thing. <coughs> oh, 
Alright. I don't think I'll rush, just to West 10. <coughs> All right. All right. So there's the winners 10s and 11s. All right. So it's 29, 21, 35, 62, and 65. So you people get extra points, so don't leave before I find out who you are. But what I want to do now is show you. Um, all right, let me pull this out, and we'll, it might possibly foul up the sound. I'll just have to take that chance. So uh, I want to show you this project here, Project 7, because this is good, clean fun. Okay, what we're going to do is make an auditing proxy. This is how you can check the network transmissions of any portable device. What you do, this is what, oh, yeah, right. Pardon me, i got to plug this in. Okay. All right, and I turned off my wireless card, which was by design, so um, I'll hopefully be able to, that's plugged in, and this is plugged in, and it should give me an internet connection in the fullness of time. All right, let's go here, IF config. Oh, there we go, good. All right, so here at 128 projects, the one I'm showing you here is Project 7 because this is actually very cool. Now the point of this is um, you are going to make your Mac into a man-in-the-middle device. And I'm sure you can do this on a PC too. I just don't have explicit instructions. Uh, feel free to figure out how to do it on your own PC. You, all you really have to do is internet connection sharing. <coughs> so I'm going to connect my Mac to the internet with an ethernet cable, which I've done. And then I'm going to make it into a hotspot so it offers wireless access. And then the iDevice can connect through the Mac, and the Mac can watch the traffic as it passes through, being a man in the middle. This is the best way to do it, and this is the way the uh, CERT in, at Carnegie Mellon did it. They built a special router to man in the middle connections to test for HTTPS flaws. And so, and to do this on a Mac is extremely easy. You connect with a cable, and then you go to Preferences and Sharing, and you just choose these options. So internet sharing is off. There is a similar thing called uh, internet sharing in Windows. And so you, I share my connection from the AX, which is my USB ethernet cable. I'm gonna share it out the Wi-Fi and turn on internet sharing. So now I have to agree to this. This is of course probably sign of insecure and stuff, but what you'll see up here in the corner is the Wi-Fi symbol changes. And now I am not a client connected like it does when it has the three bars. I'm now the server hosting. And all of you can join if you want to and send traffic through my hotspot. Now all I have to do is get a phone. And the best thing is to use a modern, fully updated phone for this, although it really should work for almost anything with the Wi-Fi sharing. Bluetooth, you have to be pretty modern. Now there's a network called Sam's Mac. It's and, and what's that? Yeah, it should be going on City College, which would be gigabit. So, so now you can, I'm just going to join that network in the Wi-Fi. Sam's MacBook Pro is my network. So if I, um, so now my phone is in the middle. And um, or my, my Mac is in the middle, and I can see traffic. Now there are a couple other tricks here. Um, I want to pass it through Burp. We used Burp last class, and you'll be using it in here quite a bit. Here's Burp. Burp lets you see the traffic going through. So Burp runs a proxy. And what you want in this case is you want an invisible proxy. So the traffic will flow through BERT, but it will not know that at all. The end device will just put in a connection to Google, and the proxy will grab it and forward it without changing the addresses. So the phone does not know this has happened. <coughs> so that's what I have, is BERT running an invisible proxy. And the next thing is I have to, now BERT is listening on port 8080. And I have to redirect all traffic to port 8080. And you do that with the firewall. On Max, Max come with the PF firewall, which is a very complicated thing like IP tables, but to do this, all you need is a very simple setting. So I, I found some tutorials and brought it down. All you really need is to go in rules here and tell it which port to use. It turns out on my device, the 
port is bridge 100 is what's created by internet connection sharing. Internet connection sharing creates another virtual interface. So the traffic from other devices going into my Wi-Fi hotspot are coming in bridge 100. And this will take all 65,000 ports on TCP and forward them all to 127.0.0.1 port 8080. So everything that comes in from the Wi-Fi card will go into burp. And then from burp, it will go out the internet connection so I get a chance to see the traffic going by. That's the trick. And this turns out to only take two little files and a couple commands to make that work. So now, to see it work, I'm going to bring up burp and see what traffic is going through. So if I go to the history tab, it'll show the traffic going through. And if I uh, bring up a browser on my phone, and if I go to like AOL.com, I should see AOL going by here. And maybe I'm not going to see it. Wait, OK, now I have to say can, uh, cancel. It's got a problem with this. Oh, I'm going to use this one. I'm going to use my samsclass.info one that is not encrypted. The encrypted one is a special issue. And one I, there, that's the one. That was me, ad.samsclass.info that went by. That's it. That was me refreshing my phone because um, that's an insecure site. So traffic is going through, and it looks like uh, whoever else is connected to me is going to weather and such. So now um, we'll talk in future classes more about these HTTPS connections. If HTTPS connections are going through this, then they are broken because HTTPS is supposed to detect man in the middle attacks and warn you. However, the thing I'm going to do now is Stitcher, good old Stitcher. I put Stitcher on here, on the, and we did the Android Stitcher app last time, and this is the iOS Stitcher app. So if I um, if I bring up Stitcher, which is that music thing, and I log in, I'm going to log in as a at b.com and I'm going to use a password of A and let's get to the bottom here and I sign in and there's the login this is it went it called something called check authentication.php and it passed it my email of A at b.com and my password was J4 so again, we can see if Stitcher is doing the same stupid thing here as they did on Android. A turns into capital J4. And let's see what B turns into. Um, I just need to cancel this, change my password to B, log in again, and there's another Stitcher network, and now it is J5. So again, you can see What's going on? B is J5. C is probably going to be J6. No. <laughs> and uh, there it is. Indeed, J6. So, um, and in those other um, projects, you take the code and decompile it and look at the assembler and see the code that does this. And you can see that, in fact, it uh, has 64 characters and it's just rotating them around. Anyway, um, but the point of this is you could test any mobile device. You could test a Windows phone or anything you want with this. It's a real hotspot. You can send traffic through it and easily see what traffic it's sending. And uh, that's why this is a fun one to set up and worth doing. Um, it's a way to black box test network traffic and you can check for invalid SSH. So that's all I wanted to show you. Uh, I'm going to go to the lab and help anybody who wants to work here. And uh, that's it. Let me stop the recording, and I'll gather the names to see who got the uh, points on the eye clickers. This is 128, Chapter 1B.